This debate is brought to you from Brand Africa Forum by Brand South Africa. My name is Nick Benadel uh, from the Gordon Institute of Business Science. And we're talking about, uh, as you may know from the program, about the role of business uh, in Africa. And I've got a distinguished panel. I'm going to start with Dr. Sima Lushaba and ask him about uh, whether Africa already has what it take, takes. We have some strong businesses in Africa, some of them mainly from South Africa, big brands that are globally competitive. Your thoughts on that, Sima? Thanks, Nick. And good morning. I, I think, Nick, uh, I, I want to start off by saying that uh, the world over, leadership and why we follow leaders is fundamentally because they have a responsibility and ability to take us to destinations that we wouldn't have reached without them. Otherwise, there's no point in following somebody who's taking you to where you're going anyway, or who is taking you to a point where you would have reached and, and actually gone beyond had they not been there. So it, it's very important that we understand the challenges in terms of where we are, because in going forward, that's what's going to have to be addressed by leadership. Thanks so much, uh, Simo. Thank you. Gary, uh, you're in the media business, and I suppose one of the questions is, uh, is there enough content building on Simo's point that is telling the African story in our media businesses, CNBC and now Forbes, our global businesses? <coughs> How do you see the link between uh, being world class in the sense of telling the global business story, but making sure that we are telling the story that Simo is suggesting we do? Nick, I think from the outset, um, the founders of Africa Business News, by the way, CNBC Africa and Forbes Africa, sit in a company called Africa Business News. It doesn't sit in a, in a company called World Business News or Global Business News or Universal Business News. It sits in a company, an African company established in South Africa called Africa Business News. And from the onset, the, uh, the philosophy was to um, start creating a platform and, and in the economic and business environment in which the story can be told from an African perspective. Uh, and I think uh, what Dr. Lushaba has referred to here are, are very, very pertinent points that, uh, that about confidence uh, and about belief uh, and about owning the brand, um, part of perhaps what we've done over the past uh, five years in, uh, in, in covering business news from an African perspective, uh, with the international news obviously interlinked with it because you know, Africa is not an island or a continent unto itself. There are global forces at play. So, but getting views from Nigeria, for instance, the impact uh, of getting views on the Nigerian market every single day, three or four times a day over the past five years has changed the way in which people see business in Nigeria. Perhaps not single-handedly, we can't give CNBC Africa all the credit, but certainly what it's done uh, it, it's created a platform of um, people confident about the Nigerian economy, and if not confident, uh, at least defending the Nigerian position in any arguments, whether it's about global recession or whether it's about, uh, about business competitiveness. Uh, just so that every single person in South Africa doesn't think the average Nigerian is a guy who drives around Hillbrow in a flashy car and does all sorts of other things in the evenings. So the important things um, is, is that changing perceptions starts here. It doesn't start outside of Africa. Changing perceptions starts here, and also changing perceptions is something that every single person that lives in Africa can own, and every single person that is here can believe it. So I think the enabling environment is, is perhaps in the communications field in which we play. That's one of the areas in which we can contribute. And part of what the founders set out to do is to, is to you know, obviously capitalize from an investment uh, perspective uh, on a major gap in, a, in an emerging economy, which of sub-Saharan Africa is the third fastest uh, growing economic block in the world after China and India, a billion people. So um, that market will need belief, that market will need confidence, and, and that market will need brand equity as it goes into the future. So the communication platform is just one aspect of it, but, uh, you know, but perhaps intrinsically uh, linking into the brand uh, of what 
African business, what African ethics, what African culture stands for. Uh, and, it, and, and perhaps we're in a comfortable position that through the economic and business interplay, we are able to, to reflect that. Um, you know, but, but finally, um, it's not going to happen unless African countries, African people participate. Uh, and so part of what we perhaps need to get over, so this is where I stop, I, I stop talking like an investor, but more like a politician about what must be done uh, rather than what has been done. Um, the, the important thing uh, is that in order to expand, more and more people must come into the loop and believe in their own message. Mm -hmm. And that's the issue. David, you've uh, started a business looking exactly at this brand finance, and there is one African com company in the top, uh, top brand valuation in the Global 500 MTN. Uh, but which other African nations are really driving businesses and brands in your view? And where do we go in the near future? Let me begin by saying that brand finance does measure lots and lots of brand values. And we do a study every year where we, we measure the aggregate value of brands by countries. And given that this, the theme, how the West was won, really seems to be pointing to America, it seemed appropriate to say that our aggregate value for brands in America is 12.5 trillion US dollars and their overall nation branding rating is AAA. Whereas here in South Africa, at the last count, we said it was 150 billion with a single A minus, I think it was. So quite a long way to go. They have 75 times the size and much stronger. Um, and the question is, well, why? why? Why has that happened? And I think there are a number of different reasons. If you look at a nation level, one of the primary reasons is they have a huge domestic market very big home market to grow in. They have very liberal economic policies which allow brands to grow, open trade, flexible labor markets which allow people to come and go between brands, extremely strong legal protection. And if anyone's been over to the States recently and seen the sort of things that go on with IP lawyers, <coughs> the biggest boom industry in the States at the moment is IP lawyers suing each other over the rights to brands and trademarks and patents. It's a huge industry all of which is there to defend their rights so they can make money. Strong government over there, and it's a strong government that gives leadership, but it also gives active support in the form of tax breaks and very substantial subsidies. And even, in a very bad sense, I would say, uses its foreign aid policy as an instrument of pursuing American uh, brand hegemony. And I don't think there's much doubt that they do that. So very robust government support. And that's why, at a nation level, America is doing well. Why, at an individual brand level, are American brands doing well worldwide? Well, I think the first thing is they have an amazingly competitive market. Anyone who's tried to get into America, and we have, and various others have, of all the markets that are competitive, America is the one. So they have huge brands, but they've got there by being in a very competitive market. As a result, they breed visionary leadership. And we just heard about visionary leadership. People like Steve Jobs flexibility, lateral thinking, and a customer focus to get through that competitive environment. And above all, they are willing to invest heavily, both short and medium term, to build those brands. I mean, if you look at countries like South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, and Kenya, and others, they're full of very entrepreneurial, can-do kind of people. The governments all seem to have recognized that there is a need to invest in this stuff. Though here's my other slightly controversial point. Given such a wide and diverse continent, can you actually get one brand Africa? Can you get consensus and get what it means? I'm reminded of a thing in the UK where they talk a lot about Europe and the European ideal. But there was a headline in one of the newspapers in Britain about 20 years ago, which read, <clears throat> fog in the channel, Europe cut off. Because in Britain, people don't really think they're part of Europe. They think they're the 53rd state of the US, or we're ourselves, we're Great Britain, whatever we are. We are not really Europeans. And the question is, how do you create a real feel of African brandhood? I think within individual countries, you can. So what you need to be able to do it, whether it's at a, 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 um, a continental level or an individual country level, is stable visionary leadership. Um, plenty of financial and other kinds of support, structure and legal protections that allow you to do that, and recognizing, I think, that there are differences within the continent. 
and recognizing you don't always have to be going along the same road together. Sometimes they can be different. Thanks so much, David. Um, very good inputs, and we'll come back to those provocations, I think, a bit later. Tawanda, uh, he's the chairman of uh, Econet and uh, has had a lot of experience dealing with regulatory hurdles in the continent. And so the central question, what role uh, do African governments have in helping African business grow locally and globally? I think one common feature amongst a number of uh, African countries is that you'll find that governments also participate <coughs> in business. The, the problem with that is government ministers who would have been assigned over specific portfolios would tend to look at themselves as the protectors of the state enterprises in those sectors, thereby compromising the role that regulators play because they would be a regulator and competitor in the same sector. It's an issue Econet had to encounter in a number of countries and some of you will remember that for Econet to get licensed in Zimbabwe, the first application had to be made to a competitor at the time because the competitor was the regulator, which was the, uh, the, the which was Tel One, the, the state enterprise in the sector. And, and that situation is similar in a number of African countries, which then hinders the growth of African companies and particularly they are spread to other African countries. Um, the second issue is the flow of capital. A common feature of African economies is that uh, there are exchange controls. Exchange controls that are designed to encourage the inflow of, uh, of investment but restrict its outflow. That scenario would tend to hinder the growth of African businesses that intend to spread outside their country of domicile into the other countries. Because before they can spread out, more often than not, they will need to make applications, go through processes whose outcomes are not very clear, and at times, the processes are largely discretionary, where certain notions of national interest have to be considered, and that hinders the growth or spread of African businesses, particularly if they are to become global players. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Very interesting. We'll, I'm sure we'll come back uh, to a number of those issues. And when the panel's done, I'm going to ask Dr. Moyo to pick up. She might have one or two views on, on what you've heard. But let me move next to uh, Mr. Amadou Mateba. Um, and uh, let's hear more about the media and uh, growing African-based media businesses. I just want to, to start by where Gary uh, left it, which is, yes, it's great to have um, powerful media houses on the continent. We should be giving you know, the voice uh, of local entrepreneurs or even local government officials. And that's, that's, that's great. Now, when I see that and I applaud it, I also want that movement to be accompanied by something which is really um, core and fundamental, which is changing the reality. Now, it's great to have you know, a first-class, world-class uh, media news organization, and anybody can go onto it and you know, air their views and present their views in the most, um, you know, in the nicest way possible. And that would go to a certain extent. The most important thing, I believe, is to be able to actually air the change which is happening. Like, talk about the real changes. Let me give an example. If you took the reality of a country like Rwanda, coming from 1994, with all the catastrophe which we have witnessed there, which now has become, you know, emerged as one of the leading continents with, you know, very much business friendly, even if you didn't actually use a world-class um, news organization, the perception would still be out there that, you know, something good is happening 
out of Rwanda, even if you don't use the networks, media networks. So in other words, what, what I'm trying to say here is, you know, very often people say, well, the media have to help change the image of the continent. And I just don't believe in that. You know, I don't absolutely not believe that the media can change the image of this continent. And yet, many politicians, many business leaders always ask media leaders to do that. I mean, the image of this continent will change once the reality on the ground has changed. That's just bottom line. Thank you very much, Amadou. Let's, uh, let's turn last on the panel to Nigel Hollis, uh, who is with Millwood Brown, uh, is an analyst and uh, spends a lot of time in aeroplanes uh, <laughs> analyzing uh, this issue. The floor is yours. Thank you, Nick. <laughs> Where to start? Um, I think one of the points I'd like to start with, I think that Africa is in a great position right now not to follow the mistakes that have been made by Western marketers. And when I heard the title of your book, I was kind of intrigued as to what the content was, how the West was lost. And it was like, okay, this is interesting. I don't deal in the area of business and legislation and logistics and so on. I deal with the intangibles of branding. And I think one of the intriguing things to me is many of the brands that people around the world look to today are still the Western brands. Everybody puts Steve Jobs and Apple up there. I was doing a presentation in China and I happened to mention Steve Jobs' name and they, there was a sort of <gasps> from the audience and it was like, he's a god. <laughs> well, you know what? He is unique. There is absolutely no doubt about it. He, provides, he has provided Apple with vision and a certain degree of uh, authority, shall we say, to keep people on the straight and narrow in terms of delivering a unique experience. And I was uh, particularly struck by the fact that Apple is so unusual compared to many brands in North America and in Europe. The fundamental problem that those countries are facing, marketers in those countries are facing right now, is that they are becoming commoditized. And why? Because they have lost faith in what really makes a brand worth having. If your brand is meaningfully different from the competition, then it will be able to command a price premium in the marketplace. And all too many marketers in the West are now discounting their brands in order to win penetration and to get repeat purchase. But they, in the process, they have lost what they stand for and they are now trading on the lowest price, not the best brand at the best price. And that is fatal. And I think there's a great opportunity in Africa and many developing nations not to go down that track. So I was very struck by uh, Dr. Mutambara's presentation this morning, where he talked about relevance and differentiation, because those are two key criteria of what makes a brand meaningfully different. I would put it slightly differently. I'd say there are actually four key components. Number one, which in terms of nation brand perhaps relates back to vision, it's purpose. What is your brand doing to serve people's needs, their aspirations, and their desires? It doesn't have to be a laudable ideal, but you need to have a role in people's lives. And, and this is where many brands struggle, particularly when you're talking about uh, a developing economy brand, delivery. Can you actually deliver against that purpose? And then, of course, we come back to being meaningfully different. What actually separates you out from the competition? Because otherwise, you will remain a commodity. You won't attract new customers, as if, unless you're cheaper than the competition. Uh, you won't be able to command a price premium. And once you've got a strong brand in your home country, that's the point at which you need to start thinking about extendability. Moving on to new categories, moving on to new countries. But if you don't have a strong brand at home, if you don't know what connects with the people in the culture that the brand grew up in, then quite frankly, you haven't got a hope to move out to new countries and new cultures. I want to just build on something that one or two of the panelists said about strong leadership, and in particular, 
ask you as an economist or perhaps a political economist, uh, what's the criticality of, of democratizing Africa to economic growth? I think that um, what places like China have shown us, and not just China, Chile, um, Singapore, many other countries have shown that actually a strong government, which, and by strong I don't mean they're necessarily going out and executing their people, I'm saying governments that have a strong ideological view about the role of those, their country and their people, um, not just in, in, in the nation state, but in the broader world, I think can actually do a great job at reducing poverty in a meaningful way and actually creating economic why, growth. Why is it then that so many of the strong leaders of Africa have taken us down a, a really bad both political and economic path? I think quite simply it's greed. It's greed and, and it's myopia. And is democracy not the form of correcting greed? No, not necessarily. I mean, can I just say for a moment, you know, I mean, again, I live in, in so-called Western, you know, democratized countries. I would argue that the biggest problem the United States is facing right now in trying to solve these very big problems it has is the democratic process. They've got too many elections. The government's become myopic. You know, President Obama has got no time to worry about what's going to happen to the education system in 20 years mm -hmm. when he's facing an election next year. What he cares about is what are the things that I need to do today in the democratic process so that I can win election again. I, and so I think we can get too focused on a political process. Um, I think what we really, really need to do is first and foremost, let's, let's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, let's feed our people, put a roof over people's heads. We do need those constraints to control government, of course, but at the same time, let's, let's do the things that are most necessary first, Thanks the so most much. urgent things, instead of rushing forward. Thank you, N process. Nigel's twitching, so I think I'm gonna. <laughs> Let him respond well, <laughs> quickly before I turn to the rest of the panel. The only reason is because I have to agree with what you said, firstly about the US, but I think the key point you're making is it comes back to predictability. What business needs is something that's predictable before they'll invest and before commerce will thrive. And when democracy doesn't actually give you that predictability, <coughs> that's a problem. Let's finish this topic before we come to others. Any other takers on, on this topic? Yes. Uh, Professor Gary. Gary. I think what's wrong with democracy in Africa, as opposed to some parts of the world where it's successful, is um, it's the wrong way around. Uh, good democracies have selfless politicians and greedy capitalists. It should be the other way around. Selfless politicians and greedy capitalists is what makes, and entrepreneurial capitalism breaks poverty. Entrepreneur, entrepreneurship uh, breaks um, recessions, um, and, but the single catalyst, and, and perhaps when we talk about leadership, um, selflessness uh, is perhaps the greatest quality of, 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 of any political leader. Mm. At the moment, um, in, in many emerging economies, selflessness comes from uh, all kinds of benevolent investors and, and all kinds of, of global initiatives and foundations putting money into, into initiatives to fight poverty, to fight edu um, you know, lack of education. So, um, and, and, and within that, the, the concepts, and I'm sorry I can't get away from the fact that I'm, a, I'm from a media background, uh, the, the, the concept of free speech and communication is perhaps one of the single uh, strands that goes through, whether it's in a selflessness environment or in a selfless environment, uh, or, a, or, a, or a dictatorial one, um, being able to speak up in free speech is in essence. We're going for a short commercial break. More on Brand Africa 2011 when we come back.